There was a radio commentator that used to come on the announce uh, radio programs, and he used to do a segment called The Rest of the Story. And I think um, Ace Hardware or somebody sponsored it. And You know, some people will remember it, some people don't. Maybe you don't know what I'm talking about. But what he would do is that he would take segments of news that maybe you didn't know about, and then he would research the background history behind it and describe and tell in detail what set up the story and then what happened after the story was reported. And then he would always end the segment with, and now you know the rest of the story. And what usually happened within that segment that he was talking about, there would be some kind of lesson in it, some moral lesson or some methodology of looking at it that he would somehow bring out the aspects of either the fail, fallible of society or the heroic in some person or just some thing that was kind of interesting. You know, like Arsenio Hall used to go, hmm, you know, on his show. And it was kind of like that. You know, there was a, a point to it. You know, there was something about it that gave us a perspective that we didn't know and we didn't realize. Sometimes in scripture, we don't take that part of the rest of the story and apply it like we should. And when we do that, we sometimes skewer or maybe don't completely comprehend the full spectrum of who God is. Because there's a lot that we can see, and that's the part that we have to deal with, the parts that we can see. But just like there's ultraviolet light, we know there's more to light than what we can see because there are shades of light that we can't see. And there are I was going to say, I can't think of the other kinds of light besides ultraviolet, and then I was going to say subviolet, but I, I don't think it's called that. But there are other ends of the spectrum of light that we can't see and we don't comprehend. In the middle is basically the light we see, and that's how we deal with God. But even in the part that we see, we choose what we want to see. We don't want to hear sometimes the rest of the story. You know, it's interesting is that a lot of times when people share, like especially nowadays about when Jesus was born, you know, they tell this beautiful story and this beautiful lesson about, you know, Jesus was born in Bethlehem, you know, and he was uh, raised in Nazareth, you know, and he, you know, being told in a dream, left to go to Egypt. But people don't talk about the slaughter of the innocents when Herod went and killed every child up to three years old in Bethlehem and the surrounding cities in Judea. We don't talk about that. You see, we don't want to talk about children that died and literally went to hell at the same time that Jesus was born. Because we want to celebrate Jesus' birth about the good news. Behold, I bring you glad tidings of great joy. It should be unto all people. Born to you in this day in the city of David, a Savior, even Christ the King, for he shall save his people from their sins. But we don't talk about what the consequence of the sin that had gone on before Jesus was born. You see, the consequence of sin was that the priesthood was making up phony holidays like Hanukkah because the Spirit of God had left the temple. There was no God in the temple. God was not there. God had not spoken to the Jewish people. God personified himself by speaking through his son. He no longer was in the temple. And because of that abomination that had gone on and that desecration of the temple, Jesus came. Jesus came to reveal what was wrong with us and our lives and why he was the only methodology to get to Jesus, to get to God and to know God in a personal way. Because of that abomination, they made up a holiday to say that the presence of God came back. They made something up to cover the fact that God was no longer with and no longer in the temple of God on earth. Now you know the rest of the story behind Hanukkah. But you see, I didn't want to just talk about the rest of the story about what happened there at the temple. I want to talk about what happened like with God still using it anyways. Because you see, 
There was Zechariah who went to the temple who was in his order and God spoke to him by an angel. Notice he didn't speak to him from God's presence, but an angel spoke to him. Notice that it wasn't God that silenced him, but the angel. See, the presence of God was no longer there. So we know that the temple was no longer sanctified and holy as it should have been. The question we have to ask ourselves, are we sanctifying ourselves and as holy as we should be? Because is God's presence in us, or are we just talking like he is when he's without us? Because that's kind of the question that you have to ask yourself and you have to deal with in the reality of knowing that God is holy. Because, you see, the rest of the story is kind of interesting. We love to talk about grace and mercy, but we forget to mention people are going to hell. We forget to talk about people will choose to die and perish in their sins. We forget to talk about children don't automatically get a free ride to heaven. There is no such a thing as the age of accountability. There is no such a thing as automatically allowing for God is going to save every baby that dies. Every aborted baby goes to heaven, we're told. That's a lie. Nowhere in scripture does it say that. Nowhere. You can't find one scripture for it. You'll see people manipulate, string them out, try to talk it into, oh, we've got to make it fit, we've got to make it fit, we've got to make it work. Because after all, we don't want to put the judgment of God on top of the mercy of God and put the grace of God all through it because Jesus died for our sins. We have to somehow apply some other way of salvation so that all oh, the poor little innocent sinners born in sin, conceived in sin, and suffer the consequences of the actions of their parents, which is sinful. We can't put God into that kind of picture. God isn't just and righteous and holy. He doesn't, like, spare them from having to know God because he's going to take them to heaven straight away because then we can offer another way of salvation. We can slaughter our children so that they'll go to heaven. No. It doesn't work that way. You see, God is holy. God is righteous and God is true. And the rest of the story of salvation is that the price that's paid is the consequence of sin. There are billions of souls that perished because of sin. And God treated it as such. In such a way that he said, I will die for sin. I will offer my life for sin. I will be the propitiation for sin because there will be no other way that any man, woman, child, or baby, or aborted fetus will enter into heaven except that it come through me. There's a serious part about our gospel. There's a reality check that you need to understand of the rest of the story. You see, if it cost God his only begotten Son, the sins of the world have a consequence. When you sin, there's a price to pay. There is a consequence that goes out from you to every other single soul living and alive and being. When someone takes a life in abortion, there's no free ride to heaven. I'm sorry. When someone murders by accident or by intention, a living soul and it has not made a choice for Jesus that soul is condemned to hell I'm sorry that is the way God is that is love personified because God has said that every single human being in all of creation has known God at some point in time and he has said that the sins of the father are visited to the generations even to the third and the fourth generation so if that soul that child winds up in hell. Where did it start from? How did that sin perpetuate itself? How did that consequence of an action go onward to cause someone else to pay the price? See, I know. I know from my own family's experience that there are things that have been passed down from generation to generation that have been brought forward to me when God said, stop here and save me. Because God spoke to me of why he saved me at one point in time. Because my generations had gone on in sin for so long. One after another in bitterness, in anger, in wrath, in devastation, in hatreds, in sarcasms. And God spared me. And God said, it ends here. And from that moment on, 
My family got saved. My mother got saved. All those people around me got saved. My extended family got saved. Now I'm not so sure about my nieces and nephews. One of them I'm really concerned about. But I'm praying. But of that immediate family that came into contact, they got saved. Praise the Lord. But the rest of the story of who God is, is the living, holy, righteous, and true. God knows ahead of time who will be saved, and He's written their names in the book of life. So irregardless of whether a person dies, He would have known that that soul would not have been or ever chosen to be saved. So when someone tells me that God isn't fair because you know somehow that some baby died and that He could condemn it to hell, He doesn't condemn it to hell. He gave every opportunity that he knew for the foundations of the world were ever created that that soul would never have made a choice for him. So he determined that that soul would not go on and cause others to fail and to fall and to fall on to that kind of sin. He spared out of love the third and fourth generation from that sin that was going to be perpetuated by that life. Only a living holy, righteous God that's greater than we are, that is so much more than we can see, that understands time in a way that we don't have a comprehension of, could ever do something like that. Because you see, any other answer that a person comes up with is man-made, not God-made. And that's the point. We want what God made for us. Salvation. We want the world to be saved because God loves the world. But the rest of the story is what God can't save, God removes from His presence because it cannot exist in the same place where He is. He is holy, He is righteous, and He is true. And anything that is not perfect in His sight is instantly consumed like a fire. And that's the point. The person that is separated and segregated and cast into a lake of fire isn't being condemned in the sense of torment because of the reality of what they did or didn't do, but it's because that imperfection cannot be in the same place as perfection. And they had the chance to be made perfect. They had the chance to be made new, to be made into something that could stand in the presence of God. That's what the lake of fire is. It's a separation designated only for angels. It was never intended for any part of humanity at all. But if humanity can't rectify that imperfection and corruption that it has become, then it is cast aside because corruption standing in the presence of God is consumed. God can't allow that person to be consumed. So he sets them aside into the only place where they can exist. Like a fire. The rest of the story... Is it pretty? The rest of the story is torment because incorruptible cannot be with corruption. And what we are is corruption. Unless that corruption puts on incorruption, it is consumed in the presence of God. There was a firebrand plucked out of the burning. The sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness has surprised the hypocrites. Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? We had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but trust in God, which raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a death, and does deliver, in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, be instant in season and out of season. Others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord, the Lord of hosts, who will have all men to be saved, and who will cause to come to the knowledge of the truth, the Lord, 
God. If I could, I would take to every generation the same realization that guess what? We, like Keith Green said, are responsible for this soul of generations that we live in. The people around us, the people that abide with us, will make their own choice. But that choice has a consequence to us too. Should we not do so, like Ezekiel was told, if the blood be upon our hands, then God requires it of us. If we do not warn or do not speak or do not share, if we do not say, if we do not at least give some opportunity for a person to realize that there is something more than the reality of what they think hell is or heaven is. There's something more to this life than what they think is only physical and they don't know the spiritual. There's something more to the rest of the story than just pie in the sky and fly away with harps in our hands and singing every day and the consequence of the people we know dying even as when Jesus was born the children were slaughtered there's a reality check there's a consequence there's a persona that's out in the world to deceive everyone into enjoying their salvation without recognizing their reason of being saved which is to tell someone about Jesus, which is to share with someone the salvation they've been given, which is to pass out that gift of God we've been given freely so that we could tell other people they need not suffer the consequences of sin, which is death, but they can have the gift from God, which is eternal life. And that if we don't share that, if we don't do that, then those that we watch raised up in this last generation, the Armageddon generation that is being prepared for war, as they are so violent that they will kill from childhood onward anyone that stands in their way. They are a generation prepared to go to hell, to march into hell for a hellish cause. And they will go, willingly so, avid and happy to exercise the violent means and corruption that they have in their life. There is a consequence to what we have not done and what we need to do. The rest of the story of the gospel of grace is the sovereignty of God and the condemnation of corruption. God will condemn everything that is corrupt in his sight. But that we can rest assured. So we teach and we preach and we share Jesus because we love to see the Lord. But we also know that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And that it is, most assuredly, not a terror of God to know our Father, but a fearful thing to fall in the hands of a living God, especially if He's not the Father of your faith. If someone does not know God through His Son, Jesus Christ, they will be eternally tormented forever and ever and ever and ever. And I'm not Ezekiel. And I'm not an evangelist. And I'm not a preacher. I'm not a teacher. I'm just a man. But as a man, I don't want anyone's blood on my hands. Do you? It is a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God. But it is God who is at work both in us to accomplish his purpose, which is to go out and teach all nations, but to go out and to share the reality of the salvation that we've been given. Oh, how precious is the blood of the Lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world, but oh, how precious is the reality of Jesus when he touches a life and saves a soul from going to hell.